Hi everyone, thank you for joining us. My name is Shane Murray, reference librarian at the Thomas Crane Public Library. Today I am interviewing Thomas Dreyer, a genealogist at American Ancestors and the New England Historic Genealogical Society. Mr. Dreyer, who has over 30 years of experience as a genealogical researcher, will be giving a workshop at the library on February 10th. This workshop will explain how to use DNA in a family history research setting. Today we are going to ask Mr. Dreyer about his work as a genealogist and what people should expect when attending his program. Mr. Dreyer, thank you for coming. Oh, thank you for inviting me, Shane. So I wanted to start our conversation a bit with your background. According to Vita Brevis, the official blog for the NEHGS, you graduated from Boston University with a business degree. How does somebody with a business background end up working in genealogy? I'd say purely by chance, I would say. Uh, I, I'd always had an interest in, in genealogy back in the early 80s, uh, visiting my cousin in Nebraska. His wife got me interested. She told me a little bit about our family history that I wasn't aware of. It wasn't her family, so she wasn't particularly um, interested in pursuing it herself, and she thought that I might be interested in doing so. So I thought it sounded like an interesting thing. Um, and I did. On, on weekends while I was working in my business, I, I would I would kind of dabble a bit and spend some time doing that every weekend or every other weekend to work on that. And I found it an enjoyable endeavor, and I learned a lot about my family as I went along. And what was your connection um, to the New England Historic Genealogical Society? Um, was there just an application that you filled out and they accepted you, or was there something more to it? Well, no, it's, uh, it's kind of interesting, actually. Um, I, I owned that business for about 30 years, and at the, in 2010, I decided that it was time to move on and, and do something different. So I sold my business, and when I got home, my wife said, I don't want you hanging around the house all the time. <laughs> um, and now that you're retired, uh, you should find something to do. And I thought, well, I've always enjoyed genealogy. Let me look and see what I can do in that, in that area. And my original intent really was not to work for the society. It was mainly to uh, volunteer. So I volunteered, I began by volunteering at the society. And uh, I started by doing some transcriptions, uh, uh, indexing, uh, computer indexing for, for the, this, the uh, NEHGS. And I went from there, I got a little bored with that kind of quickly. And, and I went to, I, I asked if there's anything else I could do. And they actually recommend that I do some uh, conservation work, help them in the conservation department. I helped repair old bot documents and books and things like that for a while. Uh, but I really was interested in the research, so I wanted to get back to that. So I, at one point, I, I talked to our research services director and asked if I could, if I, if I could work for them part time. And they were, I hadn't had any experience in the past doing this, so they were a bit skeptical, as you might imagine. Uh, so I offered to work for free for, for six months. And wow. at the end of that time period, she, she thought that I was doing a good job. <laughs> She'd be happy to hire me. I'd be pleased with that. And if she wanted to fire me, no problem. I didn't have a problem with that either. Sure. And at the end of six months, she said, okay, you're hired. And I, I started as a researcher. Um, I did that for a couple of years, and I discovered that... Uh, I enjoyed doing the research a lot, but I also missed the dealing with people that I had in my business. Um, it was mostly just sitting at my desk and, and doing your online research and book research here in the library, and I wanted to be more involved with the people I was, I was helping. So when a, a position came, part-time position became available for a genealogist on the desk, I applied for it, and uh, I, they gave it to me. So I started working part-time as a genealogist. and. Uh, eventually, a full-time job became available. They offered me that, and uh, so here I am, formally retired, now working full-time as, as a genealogist. And I've learned a lot here at, at NEHGS. Um, uh, I thought I knew a lot when I first came here as a volunteer. I discovered there was a whole lot I didn't know, and th there's a lot of advantages to coming here and, and doing the work here. Now, I'd imagine that work um, translated into your own um, family research. Um, I looked into some of the blog posts that you did for NEHGS, and there was one particular one that caught my eye. Um, would you mind telling us about Norca and Balzer, and what these words mean, how they relate to your own family's history? 
Sure, I'd be happy to, Shane. I, it, it was as I was got into my research, I kind of knew that my my this is on my mom's side of the family. Both of her parents were immigrants from Russia, and they were from a an area in Russia along the Volga River. Mm-hmm. And this is an area where back in 1763, the uh, the the, the Tsarina, uh, Catherine, uh, Catherine the Great, had invited many of her German. She was originally a German princess. Had invited many German people to settle in Germ in Russia and along the southern borders of Russia, the Volga River, and this was quite appealing to a lot of Germans because they'd just been through a lot of wars. There was famine going on, and and they were looking for a, a way to escape and find a better life. And they thought perhaps this was it. And so, well, probably two or three hundred thousand immigrants moved from Germany to Russia, and they formed villages all along the Volga River, all German colony villages that they formed. And and they pretty much stayed by themselves. They intermarried among other Germans. And eventually, uh, things got to be tough in the late 1800s, and most of them left. And by, by, the, by the early 1900s, they began to be purged by the Russians out of there. So uh, really, uh, those colonies really don't exist anymore, unfortunately. But, uh, but fortunately, my ancestors came before the, the problems really got pretty bad. And uh, so I learned a lot about, uh, about my family research uh, and my family history back in, the, in Russia as well. And in fact, I actually found where they came from in Germany in the seven, early 1760s. That's incredible. Now, I'd imagine that since you said you started dabbling into genealogy in the 80s, and now we're up to 2020, that the field of genealogy must have gone through quite a transformation within that time. Um, could you tell us a little more about the transformation, how it's impacted you as a genealogist? Yeah, it's, it's quite a bit different than what it was back in the early 1980s when I began my, my journey. There, there was no internet in the early 1980s, right. so you couldn't go online to, to look up information. You know, there's no, there was no ancestry. And so. Um, it was, but it was the very beginnings of uh, being on the computer, using the computer for genealogy. And they were, they were basically what you what you had were message boards, and you would go onto a message board, you'd post the family names you were interested in researching, and other people would look for those names and then find your name that you were interested in. They would contact you and say, oh, "My family is also a, fr- a Starkle. My grandmother's maiden name was Starkle." Mm-hmm. Uh, they. So I, I found very early on, I found a, a relative out in Washington State who was very distantly related to me. In fact, for a, for a long time, we couldn't figure out exactly how her Starkles were related to my Starkles, but eventually we did. But um, yeah, before that, during that time and before that time, people basically went to um, to church uh, churches to get baptismal records, uh, town clerks of vital records. Uh, land records for uh, the county land records, also probate records to determine relationships, things like that. Also, they, w- they would write letters to people with the same surname and say, I'm doing a book. Often people would get books on, particular, on their family and they would, they would start with an immigrant and they would write to everyone with that surname that they could find in the in city directories and ask for information about their family. And people would send all the information to their families and then the person who was doing the book would kind of collate it and arrange it all and get it all together so it was, it was one large family. And, uh, and that's pretty much all they had available to themselves at the time. Right, and that brings us to today, and you have a workshop that deals with DNA and family research. Um, so let's talk a bit about that. Do you mind giving the audience a little overview of what that workshop is going to look like? No, not at all. It, it's basically a beginning workshop. The, the if you're not familiar with, with how DNA is used in doing family research, this is really the, the beginning type, beginning steps in getting involved. And pretty much what I do is I talk about what DNA is, the different types of DNA that there are, uh, which companies give the tests, mm-hmm. and what the results of those tests may be, and also how to use those tests and, and the tools that are related to them to do your family research. That's great. And um, so I wanted to ask you a little bit about there's uh, in recent years, 
been a lot of talk about law enforcement using DNA um, from these genealogical databases in order to, say, catch criminals, the most famous case of that being the Golden State Killer. Um, as these sort of uh, situations become more publicized, the debate surrounding s people's security in relation to their DNA data intensifies. Um, so what do you say to people who might have uh, reservations about, um, say, giving their DNA to these genealogical databases? Well, uh, Shane, I think people have to make their own decisions. Sure. You know, I mean, people have different views about privacy. I, I tend to be not as concerned about, about those issues. Uh, there are laws uh, that prevent, uh, for example, insurance companies from using DNA to make decisions on whether to insure you. Right, or, or employers from discriminating. You know, employers, that's right. Yeah, there are laws to prohibit that kind of thing. But there are people that have still are skeptical of that, and, and I, I respect those views. And if, if, that's, if that's an issue, then... You know, I, I would understand if you didn't want to take a DNA test, that's fine, you know. But it, in some cases, you really have to do that in order to find what you're looking for. Exactly. You know, I, I'll give you an example, if you, if you don't mind. Um, Great. My grandmother, my grandmother and her twin sister were born out of wedlock. A month after they arrived here with their, after their mother, they, their mother arrived here from Germany with her family. Um, as a result, she was conceived in Germany. We never, they never talked about who the father was. I thought I'd never learned who the, who the father was. Mm. But through DNA, I've managed to discover, with well, at least the family. I haven't found the, the father yet, but I found the family that, that he's from. Wow. So, and I have hopes that I might be able, will eventually be, be able to do that through records in Germany. It doesn't look as if this person actually came to the United States himself. Uh, otherwise, I think I probably would have found him more easily. Right. But... Uh, but I, but I, I think it's possible I will be able to discover who my my great grandfather was using DNA. Right, and so the pros and cons will always be weighed out, and it's really somebody's own personal, you know, preference whether or not they want to donate it. Right, or not. that makes sense. Right, how, how strong and how and also how strong do they feel about how beneficial the DNA research can be to their own particular case? Exactly. Well, it's all very interesting. And Mr. Dreyer, I really appreciate your time. In the last few moments uh, here, are, is there any information for maybe the DIY genealogists out there or any resources that you want to uh, impart to them? The New England Historic Genealogical Society is a pretty valuable, can be a very valuable tool. Uh, there's a misconception that because we're, we're the New England Historic Genealogical Society that we deal only with New England, and that's right. not really true. We have specialists in all different areas. We do a lot of Irish research, for example, people whose ancestors came from Ireland. Uh, and we have experts in each of these areas. And just like I, you know, I'm a, an authority on DNA, mm -hmm. we, have, we have experts on, on uh, Irish research, Italian, German, uh, other areas of the, of the United States outside of, of, uh, of New England and, Mass and, and the United States. So. Uh, you should consider us to as a valuable tool in your research. And sure. Even though we may not actually have records here for what you're looking at, we we generally know where you can find the records and can advise you on on where to go next. Great. And is your um, the website for the NE uh, HGH a good place to start? Yeah, it's a, it'd be an excellent place to start, and you can become a member, a guest member. There's no charge for that. Just sign up at our website. It's AmericanAncestors.org. And uh, there, there's a weekly newsletter. Once you sign up, we have a free new weekly newsletter that goes out on Wednesdays. And there are a lot of other benefits that you can get as well. Perfect. Well, I, I believe you've convinced the audience to, to get on that. So thank you, Mr. Dreyer. We appreciate your time today. Thank you, Sean. Appreciate it. You got it. We thank you for joining us for this interview and hope that you're able to attend Mr. Dreyer's workshop on February 10th at the Thomas Crane Public Library.